a good Tuesday morning to you. Looks like it could be a um, pretty nice day out there. Not many of these left. Um, good morning, Chuck. <clears throat> been kind of debating how I want to get go through this last section here of uh, Luke last two and a half chapters uh, so we're we're gonna just kind of move through and get as far as we get and then we'll we'll uh, call it a day and pick up tomorrow where we left off um i think that um is going to do it i don't think uh seems like there should be something i should be saying but i don't think there is <clears throat> so on that note um let's pray and uh get started here this morning Father, we thank you for this another day, and we thank you for this another opportunity to be in your word, and um, ask that by your spirit you would guide us, um, teach us in this time, uh, bless this time uh, together, I pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, what did I do with my phone? Excuse me, I got to... Uh, let's see, how do I do that? Well, I guess I won't. Um, <clears throat> I forgot to put do not disturb on. And uh, so I'm starting to get, uh, yeah, I'm starting to get text messages. So my apologies. We'll uh, just, we'll just let, let it ding. All right. <clears throat> We um, ended yesterday uh, in the upper room. Today, we're moving out of the upper room back to the Mount of Olives. Um, so verse 39 is where we're picking up. And he came out and went, as was his custom, when it says he came out, meaning um, out of Jerusalem, and uh, as was his and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives. That's that back and forth that they've been doing all week. And it sounds like, again, it's very possible that they were um, just staying on the Mount of Olives, just sleeping out on the ground, uh, which um, they probably did a lot of as they traveled around. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that we really don't think about is, you know, where did they sleep when they were doing all this traveling and everything? I think that's the one thing that um, has been an interesting interpretation by uh, the the writers and producers, directors of The Chosen, is they show this they're kind of setting up a camp and camping out, basically. So um, <clears throat> they probably spent the night on the Mount of Olives, or like I said before, yeah, I guess it's possible that they, they could have gone to Bethany, to um, Lazarus and Martha and Mary's house. But Luke makes it sound like they probably just stayed on the Mount of Olives. And Luke doesn't mention here uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. The others, uh, Matthew and Mark, do, do. But Luke's account of, of Jesus' time in the Garden is really abbreviated. It's it's really trimmed down. Um, there are some things in here that we don't get in Matthew or Mark, but really the whole um, uh, the whole telling of it is is really shortened compared to the others. And you'll see that as we go through here if you haven't read through already. Uh, so and his disciples followed him. 
So head out of Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. Last Supper's done. Um, and verse 40, and when he came to the place, the place seems would seem to be the Garden of Gethsemane, because that is, again, Matthew and Mark make that point. Um, I, you know, does, does John, um, he might. John, 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 John. Um, yeah, John just mentions a garden. So uh, assuming it is the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke just calls it the place. So it must have been a place where Jesus prayed regularly and and Luke really talks about that throughout Jesus ministry is this this um custom this Jesus going away and praying and and my guess is when they were around Jerusalem um that's a place where they would go and it was a regular pr place to pray where to me that explains a little bit more about kind of the disciples and and their response here even though the the night seems heavier than normal um it it kind of helps to explain their kind of um being a bit more at ease maybe i can say it that way um so when he came to the place he said to them pray that you may not enter into temptation um and so he's calling them to prayer, which again is probably um, not an unusual thing. Uh, I think sometimes in our minds, we maybe make this uh, time in the garden uh, a unique time. I think it was probably more regular than we think it was, which is, again, I think it explains why the disciples were a little bit more at ease or or uh, able to kind of fall asleep and miss the moment, the significance of the moment, perhaps. Um, verse 41, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Now, Luke doesn't mention Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, and then moving a stone's throw away from them. Um, it, it, he just, he again, abbreviates all of that. Um, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So we get one prayer of Jesus, where in the other Gospels, we get all three instances of what Jesus prayed. Come back, finding the disciples asleep, wakes them up, goes back and prays. Comes back, finds them asleep, wakes them up, goes back and prays, and then finally comes back and sees them asleep again and wakes them up. In in Luke, it's it's one time, essentially, that we get the prayer. And the thing that really caught my eye this time that I've never really, I've never really thought about, uh, and again, the garden uh, um, is a place where we really truly see the humanity of Christ um, in this. Um, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will yours be done. Jesus will at this point, his, his desire, let's put it that way, his desire at this point is really in opposition to the Father's desire. You, you catch that? That's, it's hard for us to say because we're like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, but we really get a glimpse into his humanity because if you are willing Remove this cup from me. That's what Jesus is asking. That's what Jesus desires. That's, and then he says, not my will, but yours be done. My will, Father, is that we do this a different way. But I'm willing to submit my will to yours. And I think as we, as we um, pray and as we, uh, interact with the Father. I think this is a, a a great example of saying, 
Father, this is this is what I would like. This is what I would want. But I'm willing to submit my will to your will. Um, and uh, again, I go back to um, to Mary, uh, Jesus' earthly mother, who, in her interaction with Gabriel. Um, essentially um, said the same thing. Uh, and so it, it, it's interesting to hear that same sentiment in, in, uh, in Jesus' prayer, as we saw in, in Mary's. Um, let's see. Uh, it, I'm, I'm all the way back in chapter 1, verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Um, and, and so this kind of submitting our will to God's will uh, is, is an example that um, we, we should follow. Um, I think sometimes, many times, our wills come up against the Lord's and we're maybe a little bit more hesitant, maybe a little bit more uh, um, resistant to let go of our will and say, not my will, but yours be done. Um, I think to express what we're feeling, to express what we desire is important. Um, and, and then to be able to say, but God, I'm willing to, I'm willing to accept what you have. I'm willing to accept your will because bottom line, God's will is not the easiest. Oftentimes it's the hardest, but God's will is really what's best in, in each situation. So Jesus gives us a, a wonderful model here to follow. Verse 43, and this is something that's unique to Luke that um, we don't see in any of the other Gospels. And again, it is a, a window into the humanity of, of Jesus. Um, some translations don't put this verse in there. Um, some of the old manuscripts don't have verse 43 uh, in there. Um, and uh, I don't see a note in mine. No, I don't. Sometimes it's footnoted. Sometimes some of the translations actually have verse 43 in the margin. And here's the deal is um, some of the early manuscripts don't have it in there. Um, and so there's thought that this was a scribal edition. But when you stop and you think about it, and normally I don't talk about this stuff, but I thought this was interesting because it makes sense. Um, when you stop and think about it, when when the scribes were were um, copying scriptures, especially later on, uh, you know, many years after this, and and Christianity had really kind of taken hold, um, there were there are instances where it's pretty evident that a scribe has has added um, a kind of an explanatory note, or they they kind of a clarifying note. And so the thought is, since some of these earlier ones don't contain verse 43, that this would be a scribal addition. However, it makes more sense when you think about some of those early ones that it was taken out because the same reason that so many of us today struggle to really consider what it means that Jesus was 100% fully human. We default, and, and if you've been around Olympic View for any length of time, you know this is kind of a, a thing of mine, but we default so often on the divinity of Christ, the fact that he was fully God. We, we default on that so much that we see more of um, Jesus' full divinity 
in the scriptures than we do his full humanity. And so that's been a thing. And so verse 43, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. That's really, to me, speaks highly of Jesus' humanity and and the fact that he needed that strengthening and an angel would appear and strengthen him. Um, it's thought that those early scribes that left this verse out um, were uncomfortable with how this portrayed Jesus uh, and, and his humanity. And to me, that makes more sense. Why it doesn't appear in some of those early manuscripts is the scribes were uncomfortable with the humanity that is displayed here, and, and they, they pulled it out. And we got to really be careful to, um, to not default so much on, the, on Jesus being fully God that we diminish his full humanity. And I think the fear is, is that we would focus on his full humanity to the point where we diminish his divinity. Nobody's in, intentionally doing that. <clears throat> but I think it's helpful to understand Jesus in, in his humanity and how in his full humanity, he, he had a will that... In, that came in a sense in opposition to the Father's will. He he had need to be spiritually strengthened. He had a need to be um, directed by the Holy Spirit. And again, this this his prayer life, as Luke records it, how he Luke says he would often withdraw to a lonely place and pray. Well, why? Jesus was not just. Um, this wasn't just playing. It wasn't, it wasn't just a, a drama that Jesus was playing out as an example for us to follow. I really believe that Jesus needed that time in prayer to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to do what he needed to do. And, and in that regard, that is an example to us of the need for us to be in prayer, to draw strength and wisdom um, from the Holy Spirit. And um, and I think that gets lost on so many people. We fail to see that about Jesus and his ministry because we are so, um, we because we overemphasize his divinity. And so uh, there has to be a balance there. Um, but sometimes it's good to let that, let that pendulum swing a bit and, and dive a little further into his humanity um, in order to gain a greater understanding of, of what it means now to, um, to be a follower of Jesus and to rely solely on the Holy Spirit. Um, so I know that was a, a, a lot, but uh, I, I get pretty passionate about this because, again, I think we overemphasize Jesus' deity to where we diminish his humanity. And so we get this attitude of, well, he was Jesus. Of course he could do that. Of course he thought that. Of course he had the power to do that. He was Jesus. He was God. Well, no. I think Jesus um, lived out what it meant to be fully human to a point where we, he, that's why he could say things like, um, he did in 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 John when he says anyone who comes after me will do the things that I do and even greater things will they do. His his life was an example of what it means to live empowered by the Holy Spirit through prayer and a dependency upon God. Um, and so I'll get off my soapbox now and and uh, and I'll I'll go on enough probably enough said verse 44 and being in in an agony he prayed more earnestly now we get a second prayer here he doesn't come back to the disciples right uh, in the other synoptics we we see that he does come back but he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground 
and the other um, gospels, um, it it's a little bit more um, that it was actually blood. Here in Luke, it's it's uh, became like great drops of blood. So um, Luke leaves it a little bit more ambiguous, so to speak. But again, we learn from the other synoptics that um, there was uh, blood and, and there's been, you know, you've, you've heard all of the, the scientific and medical explanations for what can happen to the, the capillaries that are very close to the surface of the skin um, in times of uh, intense uh, stress. And I think Jesus was under intense stress. Verse 45, and when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. Essentially, the, the, the word there is exhausted from grief. Um, this was an emotional and confusing night for the disciples as well. With everything that went down um, just prior to, to the, the, the Last Supper and what Jesus was saying about, you know, the, the, the body and the blood and, and, and even talking again about his, or well, his betrayal and, and indicating um, that something, something significant was going to go down. This was probably a, a um, stressful and, and confusing night for the disciples as well. And so what I said before about if this was a common place for them to come and pray, then it it it, it makes more sense to me why the disciples were able to, to sleep. If, if they would have understood, if this would have been an out of the ordinary place, why are we why are we going here? Why is Jesus praying? I think they may have been a little bit more alert. Um, but maybe this was a regular spot. Um, and that's just Jesus going off and praying again. He does that all the time. And he encourages us to pray. And so we pray, but, you know, we eventually fall asleep. Luke tells us, though, that they were sleeping from sorrow. They were they were worn out from sorrow. Grief is literally what that word means. They were worn out from grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And this is uh, the second time Jesus says this. And, and when he says temptation, um, that word can mean not uh, temptation to sin, but um, temptation in the sense of a, a severe trial. And they're about to enter into a time of severe trial. But they're also um, going to be entering into a time of, uh, of uh, temptation, I guess, as well. While he was still speaking, and this seems to be consistent with all of the, the Gospels, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd. Again, Luke abbreviates so much of this that we don't... We, he doesn't go into as much detail. Um, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the 12. He's always reminding us that he was one of the 12, um, which just emphasizes the, the treachery um, and elevates the, the um, I guess, the, the betrayal and in, in um, sorrow that Jesus would have would have experienced, and even the disciples. But it sounds like they they aren't one hundred percent sure yet what's going on until Jesus speaks. Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Now it just says drew near to kiss him. It doesn't say that he did, but a, a kiss um, was very common. Um, and it's still very common in in that culture, and and really even in uh, you know you see this even in Italy where men will 
will kiss each other's cheeks. Uh, Middle Eastern culture, definitely. And it's a sign of, of uh, friendship, of, of, of really intimacy, of acceptance, of love. Um, it, it really um, is a significant symbol or sign. And so for Judas to go and, and uh, greet Jesus with a kiss was, uh, would have, wouldn't have been unusual at all. But he, go, he draws near to Jesus to kiss him. Does Jesus kind of draw back? Does he let him kiss him? Or does he draw back? And it says, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? So it sounds like even the way Jesus says it, that maybe the kiss hasn't happened. Again, we don't know. I'm cut, probably making much ado about nothing. Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Which is, again, just kind of sit on that for a bit. If the kiss meant that much, it meant love, acceptance, um, uh, intimacy, friendship, closeness, all of those things, um, if it meant those things, then for Jesus to say, would you use this symbol of friendship and of love when, you're be when your intent is to betray me? Doesn't that make the the betrayal even more heinous? Um, and when those who were around him saw what would follow, so now they're like, okay, now we know who is going to betray because Jesus just said, um, would you betray me with a kiss? You know, you remember it was just a few hours ago that they were in the upper room wondering who it was that Jesus was talking about that would betray him. And now here is Judas. And now they know who would betray him. And so when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? You remember they have two swords. Yeah, that was a conversation just a little bit ago. We have two swords, and Jesus says that's enough. And again, like I said yesterday, probably wasn't, okay, the two swords are enough. It's like enough of this talk. Um, we have other things to do. And one of them, before Jesus is able to, to answer, um, one of them, and we find out, I think it's from John, that it was actually Peter, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So here's Peter, a fisherman. He's he's not a, um, you know, this should have been Simon the Zealot, right? Because he's probably the one who would have been the expert with a sword. Not Peter, he was a fisherman. And so if he meant for this sword to be a, a fatal blow, well, he he misses. He's... He, this is not his natural thing to wield a sword. And so he ends up cutting off uh, the high priest's right ear. Uh, but Jesus said, no more of this. Again, um, who's he talking to here? Well, he might be talking to everyone. Because if you're coming out, and we know from the other gospels that there were soldiers trained soldiers who were with them and Peter pulls out a sword, what's going to happen? Those soldiers are going to pull out their swords and this is going to become a bloodbath. Um, and so I think Jesus diffuses it by saying, no more of this. Stop all of you. You know, kind of diffusing this highly charged, highly uh, emotional uh, tense situation, and he diffuses it, um, uh, no more of this, and he touched his ear and healed him. Now, 
we've seen depictions of this in the movies where Jesus picks the ear up and puts it back on. I'm not sure if that's, it may be in one of the gospels. I'm not hundred percent sure of that, but here um, Luke basically says he, he touches his ear and healed him. Maybe the ear is still kind of hanging there, you know, and he touches it and heals him. So what Jesus does is he makes it very clear that he is not about violence here. You know, the disciples are thinking, okay, this is it. This is somehow, this might be the coming of the kingdom. And here we go. This we're, They're still maybe thinking military. And Jesus diffuses that and says, I am a king of peace. And so he does the peaceful thing and touches the, the guy's ear and heals it. And then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Again, the swords are probably drawn and the clubs are at the ready um, because of what Peter did. He says, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. What Jesus does here is he, he indicates that um, there's, a, there's a greater power behind what's going on here than what's being displayed uh, in this garden. That there is an evil power, a satanic power behind this. He says, this is your hour. And that use of hour, if Jesus to say, um, on the grand uh, uh, scene, or um, yeah, the, the, the grand story, um, this is how it unfolds. And this is your part that you play in this, this scene of history. Um, this is your hour. This is when the part that you play is unfolding. And it is the hour of darkness. It is, it is when it seems all hope is lost. And this is a display. This is this is the best <laughs> that the power of darkness has to offer. <clears throat> and there we go. We are uh, we're going to pick up tomorrow um, with the arrest, the official arrest, um, and then beginning the trial. Let's pray. Father, um, as we look at these events and as they unfolded um, that night in the garden, we think about this not just as an, an earthly authority arresting a, a, a person, but this is the story of our redemption, of our salvation. That your will was done in and through Jesus. That he might be that substitutionary death. The sacrifice for our sins as he was numbered among the transgressors. He was numbered with us, that his death might suffice, more than suffice, for the forgiveness and the wiping away of, of our sins. Father, help us to just mentally today spend time there and spend time in 
this passage as we consider it and we think about it. That once again, we would be um, really caught up in the significance of what you have done in the person of Jesus. Pray this in his name. Amen. Okay. Um, happy Tuesday to you. Hope you have a wonderful day. Um, I don't know if the, the the weather forecast has changed, but they said it's supposed to be you know pretty warm today, probably even 80. You um you native Washingtonians will probably start to melt. So um <laughs> Oh, I give you a hard time. I do. Anyway, um, hope to see you back here tomorrow. Until then, God bless, be well, be safe, and be a blessing to someone today.